Are you, Nick, are you letting people in the waiting room or do you want me to? Um, I, uh, we can, let me just pull this, see if I can do this. Um, uh, okay, is it looking good? Yes, and then just make sure I can annotate. Yep, okay, yeah. Um, if you wanna let them in, then it'll okay. be easier. So if I just view, hang on. I'm afraid I'm gonna mess something up. Admit all. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, everyone. It's noon. So, um, Dr. C, if you're ready to get started, I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, if everyone could please mute themselves so we don't have any background noise during the webinar, that would be great. Um, my name is Kelly. I know it's in Kelly, I think we lost you. Can you hear me can now? Can you hear me? Yes. I think you muted me, but that's okay. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Kelly. I'm the marketing director for the Gabizi Shoulder Institute and the Cleveland Hip and Knee Institute and some other things. <laughs> but uh, welcome to every welcome um, to How to Know When It's Time for Hip and Knee Surgery webinar uh, with Dr. Nicholas Callahan. Uh, Dr. Callahan has partnered with Dr. Gabizi. We're very excited about this partnership. He's new to the east side and uh, got a lot to say about hip and knee replacement surgery. So please uh, enjoy and please mute yourself so we don't get any background noise. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. All righty. Thanks, Kelly. Really appreciate uh, the intro. Uh, everyone, just a little, few little housekeeping things for this uh, lecture. As Kelly mentioned, uh, the best thing to do right now is to mute yourself so we don't get the background irritation or there's echo effects that can sometimes happen with that. Um, there is on your Zoom function, if you scroll either to your top or the bottom of the screen, uh, you uh, are able to uh, you know, navigate there. There's a little chat function in the center uh, that will say that you can click into that box. And if you have questions along the way, go ahead and type your questions into that box. And at the end of the lecture, I will go through and answer all those questions. That's probably the best way to do the question and answer section. There was previously a hand raising function. Uh, we're not gonna do that because it's a little bit of a technical uh, issue as far as doing that and answering. I wanna make sure everybody's questions are heard fully. I'll read out the question and then I'll answer your question at the end. So that way we can make sure that we get everything through. But as you go along, you can go ahead and type in there or if you wanna write it down and then type it in at the end. Uh, just that way you can, uh, you know, as you think of these questions, we can answer them at the end. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Nicholas Callahan. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, hip uh, and knee replacement specialist at the Cleveland Hip and Knee Institute. I'm the director of it. Um, and we're going to talk today about deciding when's the right time for a joint replacement surgery. So uh, first, I uh, have no relevant financial disclosures and no conflicts of interest. Another uh, major thing we wanna hit uh, today, especially with the chat function, uh, please do not type any specific questions about you or your personal uh, circumstances. Um, it's not the time to answer those types of questions. Uh, there are some privacy issues related to that. It would be best if we could discuss this uh, as in an office setting or consultation. And if you do have any questions uh, that you really have pressing in that regard, the best thing to do is to call the number at the bottom of the screen. We'll have it throughout all the slides and we can get you scheduled for a consultation visit and I'll answer any of those uh, questions for you. Uh, so try to keep that Q&As uh, and that, uh, any questions you have just to those, to those more uh, general type questions. So the first thing I wanna do too is give a special thanks to two of my trainers uh, who I learned a lot of these techniques from uh, and just the overall mentors and uh, as great as surgeons that they are, they're even better uh, uh, men. So I just wanted to, to make sure I, I gave special thanks and shout out to them. So I just wanna give you a little bit about my background personally. I grew up in Northeast Ohio. These are my three little girls and my wife who have been, has an uh, amazing amount of patience uh, dealing with me and uh, all my uh, uh, training and been through with me uh, all the way since I, before I was even in medical school. So we've come a long way through there. Uh, but I grew up in Northeast Ohio, went to Baldwin Wallace College in Berea and studied exercise science there, then went to medical school through uh, Western Pennsylvania and did my advanced uh, hip and knee specialist training uh, in Western Pennsylvania as well. 
Um, so why do I do this first off is I love this. This is my passion. I love being able to help out people just like you. So doing hip and knee replacements and seeing people being able to get back to the things that they enjoy and, you know, things that they've been putting off, um, because they've been in pain with arthritis. This is exactly what got me into medical training and, and why I wanted to become a doctor. And I love it because our technology is always kind of changing and developing and we're getting really good at these techniques. And I've seen even in my time, uh, even pre-training to now, how fast we can get people recovering and back to doing what they love to do. Um, and I think that's with better, even better ad- outcomes and higher satisfaction rates. So today we're going to talk about kind of some general points of what's arthritis, what are the treatments, and then what is how do we know if, if joint replacement surgery or having surgery is, it's my time to do that. So first off, what's arthritis? Every joint has joint cartilage on it. So there's a, a slippery substance that's smooth and firm and at the ends of each of our bones where they form a joint and that's called joint cartilage. And that you normally don't know anything about you when you're younger or when you're not, uh, before you have arthritis, you may have moved around, done activities, and you took it for granted because you just thought, oh, just move around and do this, reach up to grab this thing or get around and went up and down a set of stairs, never thought about it. But you start to notice that you, after a while, when you start to get some arthritis, there's that wear of that cartilage. It softens. It starts to uh, tear and may even start to form bone spurs and then become more bone on bone contact that's when you start to have that pain of arthritis. Okay. So what happens is over time, arthritis is the wearing and tearing of cartilage or joint uh, cartilage and the ends of the bone, that slippery substance softens, it breaks, it frays, and then the bone underneath it becomes hard. Um, It becomes very sensitive and rough and frayed. and And as you bend and straighten the knee, those bones come into more contact. And over time, it gradually, the joint space narrows and that means that those bones are contacting so you may feel this grinding pain uh, or some sharp pain and that's the reason that you don't feel it before is because cartilage has no nerve endings in it but bone has a lot of nerve endings so as those bones get irritated they start to hurt and so if you look at this diagram of two hips uh, there's the normal hip that has nice cartilage and good joint space the ball and socket joint of your hip uh, has your thigh bone and your, your pelvis bone in it. And these two bones meet and where they meet is that cartilage. And with a normal healthy hip, there's plenty of space and it moves around without any discomfort. As you start to wear away that cartilage, you see that the, the bone starts to contact, you get bone spurs, there's rough and edges, it kind of pinches, it can feel like a dull achy type pain. Those are kind of things that we see with arthritis. So on an x-ray, you'd see that on the, on the left side, uh, there's a normal joint space, there's a nice ball and socket joint, plenty of room in there as you move around or uh, bend or move your hip side to side you'd see that that motion is not impinged or it does not have any kind of catches uh, to it on the right side you can see that is that that space is completely gone on this uh, patient and they have all this white like real bright area uh, and you can see there's even some cysts in the bone with some darker areas and there's bone spurs around it uh, and that's arthritis so how does that happen? Well, it's the most common way is wear and tear. So you drive a, a car around long enough, the tar tires, they start the rubber starts to wear away and you get down closer to the rim. Um, the uh, joint cartilage can also be uh, affected by uh, medical conditions and there's various types, but rheumatoid arthritis, gout, pseudo gout, those attack that joint cartilage and it breaks it down and it accelerates that process. Uh, you could also have an injury, maybe a fracture in your hip or, uh, or some other uh, reason that you injured your hip, and that can stimulate uh, or cause the cartilage to start to wear away. And so that gives you these types of symptoms, uh, which is the most commonly reported things that people have is pain, stiffness, swelling. They maybe not move their knee uh, or their hip as well as they had before, uh, and they find their daily tasks to be more difficult. So what, when do we start thinking about, when, when can we do something about this? When would we want, what's the right time for a joint replacement? So there's many factors that go into this, but pain is one of the most common reasons that people seek a joint replacement surgery. So pain that interferes with the quality of your life. 
So one way or a, a way to gauge how your pain is because pain's subjective. Everybody experiences it differently. And we may have different experiences as far as how we identify that pain or ignore that pain. Uh, and one way to actually address that or to try to increase your awareness of this is to do a little simple calendar test, which is have your day by day calendar. Or remember those big chart calendars that we have? Uh, look on there and just mark on there on your calendar, if you manage or, uh, or evaluate your symptoms through the day and just kind of look at it and say, hey, how's my arthritis today? Is it good? Is it bad? And if you look on and you say, hey, you know, my day's kind of pretty much I'm having a, a, a decent day or it's pretty good, I mark a little happy face on there. And if you're not having quite so good a day or if it's pretty particularly bad, make a little frowny face. It's a simple way to just kind of gauge where you're at. And if you look over through the month, and you see that there's 25 frowny faces and only five of the happy faces, you're, the question is starting to be, well, what, you know, why, what are we waiting for? We need us to do something about it. I think we can make this better. If you're kind of the other side of that coin and you're at more of the happy faces and it's 25 of those and there's only five of the, of the uh, 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 frowny faces, then you can, uh, uh, pardon me, then you can uh, see that, that that's something that's a, an example of something that uh, would be more along the lines of maybe we, we're not ready for that type of procedure. There's no magic number when it comes to that, as far as that test and that pain log. Uh, you're, you're not gonna say that, oh, this is 12 days or 15 days and there's many. It's just a generalized idea to, to raise your awareness of what you're experiencing and your, and your discomfort. So. Um, another thing that you would be looking at as far as what times when, when it's going to be ready for joint replacement surgery is to look at when non-surgery treatments, anything that we're doing, pain medications, injections, they're not becoming as effective for you or you're seeing that they're, you're getting less benefit each time uh, or they just complete stop, completely stop working. You may have friends or family who say, you know, they have a really good way of looking at uh, you and seeing you from a different perspective. We all have a, a, a thought in our head of how we are as people and what we do and what, what we experience in the world. But we have these wonderful family and friends who can point out a lot of things that maybe we're not uh, aware of that we do all the time. Uh, and I found that, you know, patients will come in, they'll talk to me, they'll say, man, you know, I'm like, hey, my knee's really hurting me. I've had arthritis. And I say, well, how, how are you getting along with that? How are these different things we're doing? If there's medicines or injections, they're like, yeah, I'm fine. I, I, I can manage with that. And I look over and their spouse or their family members looking at them like, what are you talking about? You're not fine. You're miserable. Every day you're snapping at us or you're like, you're losing sleep. You can't, you know, go to the mailbox anymore. You're never, when's the last time you ever went and played poker with your buddies or went to the golf course or, you know, we're going to the card playing club or, you know, you're never there. You, you can't even go to church, you know, on Sundays or you barely make it, you know, every, every couple months. Um, and so they have a little bit closer insight to that. So talking with them and seeing how, how you're getting along. Um, there's the mirror examination. So what I mean by that is, you know, you, when you start to get with arthritis, it gets, it steals away a lot of your joys and your pleasures in life. And you kind of see that it starts affecting your sleep. You may see baggy eyes when you look in the mirror. And overall, you just look at a person that just says, that's, I don't recognize that person when I look in the mirror anymore. That's when you start to think, maybe there's something we can do about this to make you better. Ultimately, you're the one who decides when it's time for joint replacement surgery, but we make a shared decision together and we review everything and talk about that in a personalized consultation. So when I look at treatments for arthritis, you know, and I look at patients in particular, if you look at this image, this is an image, a classic psychological image, the test that they do. And they say, well, do you see a duck or do you see a rabbit? And so this image has both of them on there uh, and it depends on your perspective. So here's the eye, here's the beak of that duck or the ears of that rabbit. And so if you look on there and here's the nose. So when I look at patients and I'm treating them, uh, I don't just see one thing. I see both things at the same time and I try to adapt it to them individually. And even if you look at this image for a long time, maybe you only see one, I try to always approach everybody with both in mind and to try to tailor specifically because it changes with time. And as you look at it, that image changes, your, your treatment might need to change depend on what's going on with you in your life. Um, so what are treatments generally specifically, surgery or non-surgery? 
non-surgical treatment options are medications, injections, therapy, exercise, maybe some lifestyle modifications. So different medicines are like Tylenol or acetaminophen, anti-inflammatories, topical medicines. Uh, there are various muscle creams that you can try. Uh, Diloxetine is an uh, antidepressant, but we found that that has actually shown some good favorable results for pain relief. Uh, so that's kind of a newer type of medicine that may be something that you could talk to a primary care doctor about, uh, but we've had some good uh, results with that. And then even post -sur after the surgery, uh, some patients have had some good responses with that. Injections of steroid or gel shots, like a, a, a visco supplementation, which is like a synthetic joint fluid or kind of giving you some extra grease in that joint to help that creaky joint feel a little bit better. Um, therapy and exercises, you know, keeping your limbs uh, limber and, and, and keeping it strong, uh, that helps out a lot with uh, joint related discomfort from arthritis and also maintaining a healthy life uh, weight balance is also very effective and helpful. So keeping active and moving around and uh, doing those types of exercises is always helpful. Switching to lower impact exercises is very helpful as well. Uh, so something like a bicycle, swimming, uh, elliptical machines, those tend to help out a lot. Uh, and weight loss, uh, really one key factor is every pound that you lose of weight on your upper body uh, or throughout your body is four pounds of pressure that goes off of your hip or knee joint. So it can be very effective. Even 10 pounds can be a significant improvement in pressure uh, that you feel through your hip. Braces and various types of knee braces can be very effective uh, for some people. But at some point, uh, you may uh, find that these things are becoming less effective for you. And so we have to start considering surgeries. So on the surgery side of things, uh, there are several different options. Classically, uh, fusions and osteotomies, which is cutting the bone and, and realigning the joint to take pressure off the arthritis. Those are kind of relics of the past. They may be used in some situations for very, very young patients in their 20s or um, that are big laborers, but that's not really a common thing that's used uh, now. Um, it's something that I, I would uh, discourage usually, but there are some indications for that. Knee scopes, you may have heard about people needing a knee scope for arthritis. Uh, that sometimes can be effective, but again, those are largely falling out of favor for arthritis related uh, pain because we found that sometimes that actually makes the, the knee pain from arthritis worse. And frequently it's not as effective. Uh, ultimately joint replacement surgery, when it's time for a joint replacement, those are the most durable and the most uh, well-studied and uh, uh, helpful uh, and effective treatment for arthritis. And so there's a couple different types of uh, joint replacement uh, options. There's uh, when we talk about total knee replacement, uh, that is when we uh, remove all the arthritis throughout all parts of the knee and replace it with a, uh, an implant that is made out of metal and plastic. And so the parts of your knee, you have three parts. There's the inside part, the outside part, and underneath your kneecap. And when you get arthritis in all three parts, it makes sense to replace all three parts of that. This is a very, very long, successful history of treatment. Uh, but if you can see on this implant, I want you to look at this. This is uh, or this x-ray. This is of the knee. This is the shin bone and the, and the thigh bone. You see this metal implant, it covers this whole area. And so that'll be important when we go to our next slide here. You can see on this one, this is a partial knee replacement. And so this is something where we, we like to use, or I like to use for patients that when you only have arthritis that's in one part of the joint, why would you do a total knee replacement or remove everything that of the good cartilage and replace all of that when you can just replace the part that's worn? Not everybody's a candidate for a partial knee replacement. However, when you do, because you're not taking out the other good part of the knee, you leave these natural ligaments that are in your knee, which are not injured or have any disease, that feels more like a regular knee. And so the recovery is faster and there's less pain. Total hip replacements, that's replacing the ball and socket joint with an artificial ball and socket, very high satisfaction rates, very reliable uh, uh, recovery as far as uh, pain relief and getting back to function. Here's an example of that on an x-ray showing that metal socket and then the metal stem. Um, so my techniques, what, what do I do as far as how I approach joint replacements? Well, overall, I'd say my philosophy is one, 
that is to respect the anatomy. So it's very important, I believe, that if you're gonna do a joint replacement to try to restore that joint back to its more natural state. And so what do I do to do that? I try to use minimally invasive techniques. Um, I respect the anatomy and the soft tissues as best I can. And I really frequently with these techniques have been able to do outpatient joint replacement. And that's important and helpful because that lets you go home the same day and sleep in your own bed. So the kind of the classic uh, way of doing a knee replacement with the older techniques, uh, our patients were expected to be in the hospital for seven days and they would go home and they'd have to, you know, use a walker all the time and they could, you know, barely hop around and, and there was a lot of pain and swelling and the recovery was very long and, and difficult. Uh, with these newer techniques, we're getting people up, out, they're walking on their, their knees and their hips the same day and they're going home, they're sleeping in their own bed. And that's such a nice experience as opposed to having to be in the hospital overnight uh, or multiple days and having to hear all those bells and whistles going off. And, you know, there's sick people in the hospital, especially with COVID now, uh, having gone through, we learned a lot about that. And I think this is a kind of a better, there's never been a better time to do outpatient joint replacement. So my specific techniques with joint replacement surgery is the kinematic total knee replacement, uh, partial knee replacements, uh, anterior minimally invasive hip replacement surgery, and bikini skin incisions. So kinematic joint replacement, well, what's that? Well, classically a knee replacement is done and you have to pretty much force a square peg into a round hole. And what I mean by that is they take kind of a one size fits all approach. You just, no matter what you come in like, you go out the same way. My technique is to actually restore your joint back to its pre-arthritis alignment and position. And so by illustrating that, most people and throughout all uh, of uh, the different population, people have different shapes and sizes. And we kind of know that, that makes sense. There are some people who have no arthritis, but they have a natural kind of knock knee. And so their knees kind of bend inward. And that's what they're like ever since they're a kid. And they stay in that position. Eventually they develop arthritis and it may worsen that knock knee. And then there are people who are just straight and, straight and narrow, and that's exactly how they are when they were born and raised, and that's how they are even with arthritis. And then there are other people who are naturally not need, and they have no arthritis. That's just the way that their joints are positioned. So why would we force a person into a straight, narrow position who is naturally not need or naturally bow-legged? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And the reason that's important is because if you use classic techniques, you have to actually release ligaments. You have to make people position them into that one size fits all category. So with my technique, I uh, allows me to not release those soft tissues or those structures. I just position the implant in the position it want, your knee wants it to be in. So that allows for less pain, faster recovery. And then it feels more like a natural knee because it's positioned in the way that your knee was like before it had arthritis. So that brings us to the part benefits of a partial knee replacement. While not everybody's a, a candidate for this, this is the most natural feeling knee because we don't have to really, we don't have to throw away the rest of the joint. We only replace the part that's worn. So on most knee patterns of arthritis, they tend to affect one portion of the joint more than the others. And some people, the arthritis, about 30 or 40 percent of people have it and it only involves one part of the joint. So there's the inside of your joint, the outside part of your joint and underneath your kneecap. And so that's tends to, the arthritis pattern tends to affect one of those mostly. If it involves multiple spaces, well, that's what we talked about before. That's when you have to go to a total knee replacement because all the parts of the knee are worn, you wanna replace all those parts. But if we can have a, a pattern that is only the arthritis in one portion of the joint, that's a great chance to have this partial knee replacement. And that those patients, when we have my patients that have partial knees, love their partial knees because they feel like what their natural knee feels like. They have better results long-term. Uh, they're safer to undergo because we're only doing a small portion of the joint, not the entire joint. Uh, and their recoveries are faster. And, and, and now I'd say even 
the shorter hospital stays or same day surgeries. They're going home the same day and they're feeling you know, wonderful. So with a, a hip replacement, my techniques uh, involve an anterior minimally invasive hip replacement. So what does that even mean? Or what, what are we talking about? And why is that such a buzz term you may have heard about um, you know, in the past or along the way? Well, an anterior hip replacement is done from the front. The hip is a forward facing joint. So it makes sense if it's a forward facing joint and you get cartilage wear in it to, to come at it from the front side or approach it from the front side. Classically, that's not how it's done. The classic way to do the surgery is to come from the back portion. Um, and let me show you what that looks like. So when you do a, a, a hip replacement classically, you have to go through the muscles and the soft tissue and it takes a plane this direction. And you can see that when you go through here, you have to go through all this skin, soft tissue, and then muscle, and you have to cut all this. When you do that, that causes a lot more pain and you have to let all these tissues heal. The other technique is from the side, you have to cut through these muscles and get it down. To the hip joint. You're all trying to get to the same place. With my technique, we go through and exploit the natural interval in the front of your hip where we don't have to actually release any of these muscles. We just go right in the soft tissue plane through the front of the hip. And so that's important because when you cut muscle, it, it heals. It does not heal with muscle. The only things in your body that heal with the same tissue, if you injure them or you cut them, Bone heals with bone and liver, if it's injured, can heal with liver tissue. That's it. Everything else heals with scar tissue. And that's important, as you see on my next slide. This is an MRI of two hips that have had one, the classic way to do the surgery and with the technique that I use on the right. So if you look on this MRI, we're looking at the muscle and this is in a cross section of it. So we're kind of looking at it like cut through. And if you can look on here and you look at it, it kind of looks a little bit like steak. And that's because steak is muscle for a cow. And I won't, don't want to you know, blow that for you or ruin that for you if you've not known that from the past or didn't know that before. Uh, but sorry to break it to you. That's the cow's muscle. That's what we're eating. But you see that there's this marbled appearance. Well, that's because when you had this hip replacement done, from the side or from uh, the front and without respecting the muscles, what happens is that it gets this fatty appearance and it fills in with this scar tissue and fat. And so you can see how that white stranding area and that marbling it looks like, that's that classic approach. When you do it with this tech, with my technique, you can see look at how much more muscle is here. We don't have that fat. We don't have that marbling. That muscle stays the same. And so that, that means less pain, faster recovery, when you do an approach, when you do it from the back or the side, that you're cutting through this muscle, you have to let those tissues heal. If you don't, you have risks of dislocation. So that's where you may have heard of the raised toilet seat or not being able to cross your legs or having to make sure that you put a pillow in between. Um, there's no need for that. We don't do that. We don't cut those tissues. So you can, whatever's comfortable for you, that's safe and that it will, it will do great for that. Actually, frequently with my, my hip patients, I have to slow them down uh, rather than speed them up and tell them, hey, let the skin heal. <laughs> you know, just let's keep, let's remember what we're doing here. We still had hip replacement surgery. I actually had one lady that came back to me and told me she was riding a horse like a week after the surgery. And I said, oh my goodness, <laughs> I don't recommend that by the way. Let's not, no, no riding horses the first week after surgery as a general rule. <laughs> So the other technique that I use that I'm really excited uh, and I think is really um, something that uh, takes this approach, the front uh, hip approach, uh, anterior hip approach um, to the next level is the bikini skin incision. So uh, when you do a hip replacement, normally you make an incision, it goes on the front, it goes longitudinally or down the leg. And so that means that it's against the grain of the natural skin lines. So as you see on this diagram, the skin lines have a natural uh, uh, horizontal orientation or they lay down the grain kind of horizontally. An incision classically is made long ways and you can see that it goes against the grain. 
when you do a bikini incision, you're making that incision and it comes across the hip in this natural plane. So as it does that, it heals better in that plane, which leaves for less uh, discomfort at the incision, less wound complications, faster recovery for the skin. And the other benefit is a beautiful skin appearance afterwards because it's cosmetically uh, more appealing because it heals better. So the plastic surgeons are the ones that actually developed this for a thigh lift. Uh, and we've kind of adapted this for hip replacements, which I love because this allows for uh, you know, that respecting of the anatomy, which is my whole philosophy. So uh, if you look on the left here, this is the incision from the left. Uh, this is a six month or sorry, six weeks uh, after the hip replacement. And you can see that thin line right there. That's a hip replacement incision. If you can believe it or not, we can do it through that kind of a small of an incision. Uh, and this is at six months. I mean, look on this, this to the right. If you can see that incision, you know, on your computer screen, you might have to blow it up and look at it real close. So this is actually even zoomed in a little bit, but you can see there's, I mean, it's disappearing, but there's the kind of the hint of it left over. And so those kind of outcomes and having seen those, uh, I, I don't ever want to do it another way. It's so, it's such a beautiful uh, way to do it in technique. I, I, I like I said, uh, my patients are super happy with that and I, I'm loving it when I see those kind of outcomes. So overall, you know, kind of sum, sum up my overall mission and, and, uh, and thoughts is that I, I want my patients to have excellent and compassionate care. My goal is to improve your quality of life, get you back to doing what you love uh, and, you know, overall, you know, restore your function and, and get you back to, to the things that you uh, really care about. So I'm at the Cleveland Hip and Knee Institute. It's at Beechwood uh, Medical Center. It's in the office suite 200. Um, our appointment number, if you wanna call or have any other questions that are more specific, we can uh, go through those uh, in office. Um, but now I'd like to open up uh, at this point, the chat part of this. If anybody has any questions um, or has any things that they, they wanna know about further, uh, or any things that I could answer better that we haven't covered or that, go ahead and type in your, your questions and we'll try to answer those uh, as we go through. So uh, one thing, uh, and you don't have to be shy, uh, there's no bad questions here, um, but I will say that there's some certain questions that are commonly uh, asked uh, when it comes to uh, arthritis uh, hip replacements, knee replacements, um, is what are my, what's my recovery period? That's probably one of the most num the number one questions I get. Um, so for, uh, hip and knee replacements, uh, the recovery period with all these techniques is definitely advanced. Uh, I'd say for uh, knee replacements, about six to 12 weeks is the recovery period for a knee replacement. Understanding that over time, uh, our knee and hip replacements, they continue to make progress and get better. Uh, it takes 52 weeks to get as good as it will get uh, for a hip or knee replacement. So um, you will get back to doing the things you love and, and uh, doing the things that you enjoy uh, fast, uh, but you can also expect to see it continue to improve over time. Um, For uh, hip replacements, it would probably be around that six to 12 weeks again. Uh, and then I would say the partial knee replacements, uh, those are something that you can see uh, probably half the time, considering how we don't have to do the, the full joint replacement. So somewhere around three to six weeks, people are feeling very good with those uh, knee replacements. And again, uh, partial knees and, uh, and my hip patients, they tend to be uh, super, super fast uh, to the point where we have to kind of slow them down. Uh, and uh, tell them, hey, you know, you just had surgery. Uh, let's make sure we uh, let everything heal up a little bit. So, Dr. Callahan, are you seeing that the questions in chat, or am I just seeing those? I want to. I'm, I'm not gonna... seeing that. I'm not oh. seeing the messages. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, let me read them to you. The um, okay. one here. Uh, what can we do to prevent cartilage deterioration? Is a question. Oh, great question. So uh, one thing uh, that wear and tear of the, of the joint cartilage uh, happens with time. Uh, there are some factors because there are a lot of genetic factors that go into it that we can't control, but things that we can do to make the joint cartilage not wear and tear uh, is to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Uh, when that, what I mean by that is to keep your weight into a healthy 
weight range. So it's not to beat up on people who are bigger or have carry a little bit more weight, but like we talked about earlier in the lecture, every pound the, of weight that you carry on in excess or more than what your ideal weight is, is gonna be four more pounds of pressure on your hip or your knee. So if you have any bit of uh, pressure difference on your cartilage, that will increase the, the rate that it's gonna wear. So my kind of the way, um, uh, a, a better example of that uh, would be if you drive around a car, you have car tires and those tires can wear over time. And the more you drive them, they wear, but the car tires that we all get are pretty much the same size, right? There's a little bit of difference, but mostly if you think about those car tires being like fitting on a, a Volkswagen, now, if you drive around a Volkswagen, it's gonna wear at a certain amount. But if you drive around a Mack truck, that's on a Volkswagen tires, that's gonna wear it out a lot faster. And you can see how that can, can make it worse. So we can kind of keep that weight into a normal uh, or close to uh, ideal range. It's gonna let you, um, you know, give you a little bit more time on those. Um, healthy eating habits, making sure you have good nutrition that helps with the the weight, but also helps with your joint cartilage, staying active. Uh, so making sure that you're moving is always good. So staying still, we're not meant to stay still. We're supposed to be active. That's how we are. Um, and our joints like that motion. Uh, so staying active, like non-impact exercises is wonderful because it keeps you moving the joint, the joints like motion, but the pounding type exercises, trying to avoid those. I'm not saying that if you love running to stop running, but if you can find an alternative, if you're, especially if your arthritis pain is pretty bad, that can help you kind of preserve that, that, uh, that cartilage and, and try to get you more mileage on those tires, if you will. Um, another question is, how do you determine if the knee will be totally replaced or partially via x-ray or MRI? Excellent question. So, uh, so one, uh, there's, a, there's a list of criteria that I use. Uh, that uh, looks at and evaluates whether you're a candidate for, par for partial knee replacement. Some of them are technical issues uh, that have to do with the way that your knee is aligned um, and the way that the soft tissue is. So I examine each patient and determine based on their, their examination, how their ligaments are. Uh, and with x-rays uh, that there's x-rays looking at the pattern of the arthritis. So whether it involves all of the joint or only one portion of the joint, and then there's actually a special type of x-ray that I use that allows me to see if the part of the joint that's worn uh, is just kind of masking the other portion of the joints, then you don't see that arthritis. An MRI has been, uh, is, a, is a, a type of test that doesn't have a lot of value for determining a partial knee replacement um, because we found with studies on that, that the x-rays do just as well or better. Uh, because the MRI does not show the cartilage on the joint surface as well as regular x-rays and I, understanding the space difference. So it's kind of a complicated, um, it's kind of counterintuitive to what you would think. But I would say that it has to do with the examination. Um, and then there are some medical factors that may make you not a great candidate for a partial knee replacement. That has to do with if you have like an inflammatory arthritis that can continue to affect the joint cartilage. So that would mean that would probably not be a great option for you, but specifically it would be more along the lines of a, a personal consultation and evaluating those x-rays. Okay. Um, another question is, do you use robotics for knee replacement surgery? Oh, that's another growing area of joint replacement surgery. I personally do not use robotic uh, surgery, assisted surgery. Uh, the uh, robots uh, have been out for uh, a little while. Uh, the data on those robotic uh, surgeries uh, is that they have no benefit compared to uh, regular uh, techniques uh, or minimally invasive techniques. So uh, the robots, uh, when they don't have a benefit, obviously, uh, for uh, improving your pain, your recovery. Uh, there's no uh, uh, less, it takes more time actually to do the surgery with the robot. Um, and there's increased risk of complications like in, uh, fractures. Uh, there you have to put these pins and drill these pins into your, into your, uh, your shin bone uh, or into your hip bone. 
Um, and those pin sites can get um, infected or have problems with them or cause fractures. Uh, that, uh, to me, that's not um, something that I wanna put my patients through when the techniques that I'm using are having such fabulous outcomes. Um, just because it's new does not mean it's better. Um, so that's why I, I choose not to, to pursue robotic surgery. Um, okay, what size and where would the incisions be for a partially and total knee replacement? So great question. Uh, that depends upon uh, the specific partial knee replacement, uh, whether it's the outside part of the joint or the inside part of the joint. Um, the incision size is uh, something that is probably one of the more uh, um, important discussion points as far as uh, uh, patients, what they really, really want to know about. Um, the uh, techniques uh, as far as what gives you the best recovery uh, and what matters is kind of underneath the skin and how you treat the tissues underneath there and the bone and the, and the soft tissues um, as far as what makes you recover faster. but. Generally speaking, uh, a partial knee replacement, it's directed towards the inner portion of your knee and it's around seven to eight uh, centimeters or so. Uh, and the total knee is over the uh, front of the knee straight down and it can be around eight or nine centimeters. Uh, but I don't, I don't get caught up as specifically on the size of the incision um, as more as what is the technique on the incision, like my bikini incisions for the hips. Um, that length of that incision tends to not even really matter because it heals so nicely. It matters about what the, what do you do with the, the tissue? So, and how you place the incision matters or how it heals and how it'll, it'll look and how it'll appear. Um, so those factors are really, really important for that. So that's what, for like surgeon's perspective and, um, what you, and probably what you really care about is, you know, how's this going to he heal and how's it going to appear? you have to take those factors into consideration. Uh, there are, are, are no, they can put them in chat. I'm sorry? Uh, there are no more questions at this time oh, in great. chat, but if somebody has one, of course they can put it in there. I'm not seeing any others. Okay. Well, I would say that, um, you know, it's been a pleasure speaking with you uh, and uh, that, you know, hopefully you enjoyed this webinar. Hopefully it was helpful for you. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions. I'm sure that's tough, especially in this kind of setting. You know, you don't feel comfortable. Or you're not sure what's the right questions to ask um, or what are the things that, you know, you should be knowing. These are great questions we can address in the office or, you know, what always happens I always tell patients when I'm talking to them uh, in my office or, um, you know, even at uh, when we're talking around surgery, hey, you know, you get a question, just write it down and then come in and when you see me, we'll answer any of those questions. I'm happy to do that because you'll walk, I'll walk out and you'll think of three different questions or you'll get on, you know, we'll end this webinar and you'll think, oh, I wish I would have asked that question. Please feel free to contact us. I'm happy to answer any of your questions, or like I said, in a consultation, we can make it more specific and tailored to whatever your needs are. So I think with that, we probably, uh, yeah. there's no more questions. We can probably end this and uh, just say, I wish everyone a wonderful day. And hopefully, uh, where you're at is beautiful and sunny and shining, and you can enjoy the nice weather. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.